All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin O'Shea, and I will be your room moderator for this afternoon for Donner Doom 2016. Uh, I'm here to introduce our uh, first speaker after lunch here, David Hummels. David Hummels has been serving as the Dean of the Cranert School of Management here at Purdue since 2015. In his faculty life, Professor Hummels teaches courses in international economics and has won multiple teaching awards at the graduate and undergraduate level. His research focuses on a broad range of issues in international trade, including offshoring, product differentiation, barriers to trade and the broader impacts of aviation, infrastructure, and trade facilitation on trade and economic development. He has published four books and over 40 research articles in major economic journals, including American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy, and Quarterly Journal of Economics. Today, he will present a talk titled Global Coordination of Technology Policies, Indispensable Sisyphean. Now, please silence your electronic devices, but don't put them away. Please pull them out and go ahead and start tweeting, Instagramming, Snapchatting, Facebooking using our official hashtag, hashtag Dawn or Doom, um, or whatever social media site you prefer. And join me in welcome, welcoming uh, Professor David Hummels. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and also for overestimating my drawing power. Uh, we were originally in a smaller room, and they said, oh, no, we'll have far, far more people than can fit in that. So uh, we are small, but we are mighty here this afternoon. Uh, next year, we're going to require this uh, for graduation, I think. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, technology policies internationally, uh, some efforts to coordinate them. And at the end of this, uh, I, I hope to convince you of three things. Uh, the first is that uh, the development of new technologies in the world uh, is inextricably linked to uh, the policy environment. Uh, the second is the, the relevant policy environment is the global, not the national policy environment. And then the third is, despite the absolute necessity of getting these policies right, that uh, we face the very real possibility that the necessary coordination uh, will be ultimately futile. All right? Uh, and, and to sort of kind of get us rolling here, uh, I want to focus on our good friend Sisyphus. So uh, many of you, I'm sure, uh, know at least the broad outlines of the tale. Uh, he was, uh, as these things happen in Greek mythology, he offended the gods uh, for his, uh, uh, you know, for thinking he was smarter than Zeus was uh, and, and too crafty. And so he was sentenced to an eternity of rolling a giant boulder up the hill uh, that, you know, incredibly difficult, laborious process that was ultimately futile because as soon as he'd get it to the top, it'd roll back down on him. What you probably don't know uh, is that in some tellings of the Sisyphus tale, he was actually one of the world's first free traders. Uh, King Sisyphus uh, was known throughout the Mediterranean for being uh, a great proponent of commerce, uh, made large uh, investments in what we would now call trade facilitation, uh, investments in navigations uh, uh, to, to improve the technology for getting around the Med. Um, but despite that recognition, that trade was good for his nation, he couldn't help taking advantage of the travelers who would come to his shores uh, and would steal from them, rob them, beat them, kill them, uh, and uh, that ev eventually earned him the ire of the gods and, and, and hence his punishment. Uh, that same kind of idea that leaders of countries recognize that ultimately there is great benefits to their countries from engaging in free commerce and yet somehow can't help themselves uh, but to try and take advantage of, the, of their foreign partners is a theme that runs through a lot of what we see in modern technology policy on a, on a global scale. So let's talk about this in a little bit of depth. To get, you, to get you started here, I want you to think a little bit about the institutions that govern trade. Now, if you go back historically, there were a lot of what we call bilateral arrangements, that countries would pair off in ones and twos and try to figure out the rules of the road. And while that had some benefits to it, it also fell apart pretty easily uh, in the interwar era. So coming out of the ashes of World War II, there was an, a sense uh, that the world needed better international institutions. So out of that came the International Monetary Fund to focus on financial matters, the World Bank to focus on economic development, and the general agreement on tariffs and trade uh, that really focused on the governance of international commerce. 
Um, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade uh, was the forerunner of what we now call the WTO. And I think what's sort of notable, and you can see it in this picture, what's going on here, I have sort of the, the date at which different rounds of the GATT, later WTO, uh, were negotiated. And so the horizontal length of those bars is the duration of the negotiation. Uh, and then on the vertical axis, you can see the number of negotiating countries who are in the room. So very early on in this process, you would have a dozen or two dozen countries uh, coming to some kind of agreement about the rules of the road for international commerce. But as we go through time, two things happen. The number of people in the room, the number of countries in the room trying to make negotiations happen, grow and grow and grow. And the length of those, um, the length of those negotiations grow along with it. Now, in the Uruguay round in the, uh, that was negotiated in the 1980s went into force in the 1990s, two really important things took place. The first was uh, a recognition that it was no longer enough to simply lower taxes on trade. So tariffs are just a, a tax on imports. Uh, and a lot of the focal uh, uh, attention uh, in the early rounds of, of the GATT were just on how do we lower taxes on foreign trade. Uh, and it really looked a lot like, OK, uh, you lower your, your taxes on corn. I'll lower my taxes on steel. And we'll be happy about that. But with the Uruguay round, there was, a, there was a much broader focus on a broad set of trade facilitating negotiations, whether it had to do with investments, services, intellectual property, and a long, and a long set of other sorts of things that negotiators were increasingly recognizing were central to having a, 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 a to, were, were central to having a successful negotiating round. OK, so that, that completed, and that was great. Uh, around 2000, we tried to kick off the Seattle round. Uh, the Seattle round uh, was, was done in early death by a series of protests uh, in which folks who were unhappy about the pace of globalization uh, interrupted the talks. Uh, and so the negotiators retreated to Doha, uh, I think to more uh, defensible, uh, in a, in a like, national security sense, if not a moral sense, uh, defensible kind of uh, a set of buildings and commenced to negotiate for the better part of a decade. Right? And those negotiations were largely about the kinds of things that we'll spend time talking about today. Uh, RIP 2011, they finally basically gave up on it. Right? They just, we couldn't get to any kind of agreement, in part because uh, WTO rounds have to, get, have to get to a point of consensus, which may be doable if you've got 13 people in the room, but if you've got 141 countries with their own competing ideas of what's good uh, for them, that makes it harder and harder. And so we've had a bit of a retreat. Right? Um, very much in the news uh, and seeming very much like it was going to happen up until the most recent, up until the presidential campaign uh, was uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Show of hands, who's, who's heard about the TPP? Okay, good, good set of you, all right. So what the Trans-Pacific Partnership really represents is a full bore focus on technology policies. And it's done with a, a real focus on getting the relevant parties in the room in smaller numbers in order to go much, much deeper with these negotiations. All right, so, so what's in this thing? Um, it's probably easier to tell you what's not in this thing. This is a screenshot from the US Trade Representative's website. So uh, if anything I talk about today intrigues you at all, just go to USTR.gov, and you will find a lot of detail on what's in the TPP agreement. These are, you see 30 different chapters here. The one that's highlighted in red up at the top there, number two, that's really the main focal point of the negotiations that happened uh, in trade agreements going back to the 1940s up till the 1990s, right? One of those chapters. But the rest of this stuff, in fact, I would say basically everything from chapter seven on sanitary and phytosanitary standards all the way down through uh, probably chapter 19 or 20 uh, are fundamentally about policies for harmonizing and coordinating the regulation of technology industries. Okay? Um, the problem that we have here uh, and that we have to kind of think about with TPP is to try and figure out this question, why has there been this evolution away from just saying, I'll reduce my taxes if you re reduce your taxes, and toward these far more comprehensive agreements that include things like 
entry of business persons, electronic commerce, uh, labor and environmental standards, intellectual property. Okay, so why, why have we evolved in that, in that direction? So to think about that, uh, we're gonna do a little audience participation here, okay? And we're gonna focus on this question, all right? If you go back 120 years, uh, steamships have been invented, there's an enormous surge of, inter of, of international commerce, particularly across the Atlantic, uh, in which countries are engaged in basically commodity trade. We sell corn to Europe, Europe sells iron to us, uh, back and forth in these kinds of simple things. And that's very, I want to argue, really different from the policy environment uh, that we have today where we're trying to facilitate not trade in corn for timber, but uh, we're trying to facilitate trade in computer chips, airplanes, pharmaceuticals, and so on. All right, so here's the audience participation question. All right, I want you to think about the policy environment. So you're in charge. You get to dictate the set of policies uh, that the U.S. pursues, and your goal is to make it as easy as possible to trade corn, it's 1880, 1880 trade corn with Europe, okay? So what, what's that policy look like for you? Okay, so, so what would you do? So audience participation here. What, what kind of policy environment do you need? What kind of rules, what, kind of, what kinds of investments does a country need to be a successful exporter of corn, 1880? Hands, anyone? Railroads. Yeah, railroads would help. You have a lot of, you have parts of the United States, for example, the breadbasket, uh, which are disconnected from the oceans uh, that will enable you to get those goods uh, to Europe. So you absolutely need a transportation infrastructure. What else? Customers? Yeah, you need customers, absolutely. Um, and one of the important ways that you get customers is making sure that they can afford what you have to buy, right? That you need to be able to make sure that your foreign customers are, are allowed to purchase what you have to sell, okay? I would argue that there are really three steps to facilitating trade in corn. Build some infrastructure, lower taxes, so get, the, get European tariffs on U.S. corn uh, lowered as far as you can go, and then just get out of the way. Just get out of the way. Pretty simple policy prescription, but here's the, here's the kind of sad fact. Uh, and I, I see some of my uh, international trade economist colleagues in the audience, and so they can disagree with me on this if they want to. Most of what we understand, most of what we teach about the gains from trade come down to how and why you would trade corn with Europe, okay? It's basically corn-based trade. Uh, a, pretty seri a pretty simple set of models that use, can be used to understand this pretty well. A uh, simple set of policies used to facilitate it. Um, and a lot of our case for what we should do rests on that idea. Okay, now, how, is thing how are things different today? What would we do, for example, so I'm gonna pick airplanes, why? So we just built, uh, not we, but GE has just built this massive new jet engine plant just south of, plant, uh, south of, can of town. Uh, Rolls-Royce building a, a, a big facility out here in the brand new aviation park uh, out um, west, of west of campus. We as a university are becoming big uh, investors or big uh, partners uh, in the creation of competitive advantage in airplanes. So here's the question. You want to be successful in exporting airplanes to the rest of the world. How are the policy requirements different in this case? Please. Absolutely. Intellectual property is really critical to the value of the airplanes that you might want to produce and sell. What else? Think of anything else? Yeah, in the back. Standards. So standards are going to be really important. Uh, you, you don't want to just um, uh, produce planes that fall out of the sky. So some kind of understanding about what is airworthy, uh, what, uh, what customers can safely buy a ticket on and they're not going to die. Uh, that's an important signaling function uh, to customers that, uh, that governments pursue. What else? Yeah. Yeah, so what, one of the elements that we'll talk about here in a little bit is that very few countries, in fact, I would say no countries have the capability to produce an entire airplane by itself, that 
the specialization needed for each one of the set of subcomponents uh, is fairly narrow and trying to pull them all together and to facilitate uh, the coordination of that takes a sophisticated investment in uh, the infrastructure around transportation and communication uh, and so on. Anything else? Let's go, let's take a couple others just to kind of fix the ideas in your head. So um, let me come back to the intellectual property. So we got the first two up there. It's almost like you guys are reading off my slides. Um, the thing about the third one, who's the number one customer for airplanes? It's actually nationally owned airlines. Okay? The bulk of, of air, airlines in the world are owned by their host countries, and when uh, one of those home country national carriers buys a plane, it is typically with the financial might of the host government behind that purchase, which creates all sorts of interesting questions about what it means to engage in free trade in airplanes when the purchases are not individual customers, but are in fact the national governments involved. You also have state-owned enterprises like Airbus, who are the chief competitors in the wide-body aircraft space, the cost of creating a wide freight and jet. So estimates for the Airbus A380, one plane, run to something like $25 billion. Uh, and so uh, direct subsidies of the creation of that plane. Um, a lot of Governments, because they are uh, going to be making the purchase decisions for these national carriers, will not uh, buy a plane or will not commit to a large set of purchases unless there's some kind of quid pro quo, where uh, a producer will locate a plant uh, in, their, uh, in their home country, transfer technologies uh, to make that happen. Uh, as basically uh, the, the, the give back in terms of getting the content. But once I start moving investment around, I've also got to be able to move people around freely. It's not enough to set up a plant somewhere in China. I might need some Boeing engineers to spend days, weeks, years uh, staffing these kinds of plants. And so your ability to move people from place to place to facilitate the transfer of technology becomes central as well. Um, and then we'll talk about a couple of other things here in a little bit, how this ties into antitrust and how this ties into tax policies. Now at this point, we're pretty deep in the weeds of how countries run not just their international commerce, but how they regulate their domestic markets. You're interfering with or you're engaging with their systems for protecting intellectual property. Their, how they spend money as a national government, how they set tax policies, and so on. Uh, how they set migration policies. The consequences of all of this, and the thing that makes things so difficult for international coordination, is that all of this is not a nice to have, it's in many cases a must have to facilitate this kind of trade. So I want to try and illustrate this by going a little bit deeper on a few of these issues to see how this is going to look. Okay? So I'm going, to, I'm going to change the example here a little bit, and I want to think here a little bit about intellectual property in much more depth and detail. And to do this, I'm going to pose for you a set of, uh, really a very incomplete set of questions around intellectual property, and just to kind of fix ideas in our head, let's think about the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, uh, it's an it's a important industry uh, here in Indiana, uh, and we have some of the major world producers uh, of, of pharmaceuticals here. So let's think about some of their IP challenges. Okay, so here's the first question, and we had this sort of in connection with uh, planes. Why do you need to protect IP in the first place? Let's just kind of fix ideas here. Why, what is it about pharmaceuticals? that requires you to fix, to, to protect intellectual property in the first place? The amount of research you do for it. Yeah, I think there's, if, at, at its heart, the expense of coming up with a successful new molecule is astronomical. Um, the variety of studies that are done to try and illustrate how big these numbers are, and every time a new study is done, the number creeps up higher and higher. The most recent number I saw that came out, that was just published in the last year, came from Tufts Medical School, and the number they put that at is $2.6 billion for a successful new molecule. $2.6 billion, all right? 
The related problem is not just that it's incredibly expensive to invent a new molecule and go through the, the, the lengthy testing process, but that it is relatively easy to copy molecules once they are known to have um, to be medically efficacious. Okay, so. If you think about what you're worrying about vis-a-vis -vis your competitors, you're comparing the cost of innovation to the cost of copying, okay? The cost of innovation is very high, and the cost of copying is very low. It becomes it's absolutely uh, essential that you have some kind of government guarantee of monopoly to make that money back. I mean, that's what a, pat that's what a patent is fundamentally. We're talking about intellectual property. What we're saying is, the government is going to grant you the right to act as a monopolist for a period of time, okay? Now, when I, when I talk about why it is that I think technology policies are inextricable from government, inter, or sorry, technology development is inextricable from uh, government policies, it starts right there, right? With the government grant of a monopoly to sell a good, right? Well, let's dig in, into this a little bit deeper. So what's patentable? Now, this is sort of a, a, an interesting question because what I want to try and drive at here in the next little bit is if we, let's say we can all agree on that last slide, all right? We can all agree fundamentally with this idea that you want innovation to occur, you got to protect uh, the returns on the, in, on the investments. Um, we still have the problem of how are two countries or how are a group of countries going to get together and agree on exactly how that should take place. Okay, so what's patentable? In, in US law, it's, um, it runs something like this. So a patent cannot protect an idea, all right? So ideas are not patentable. Uh, an idea has to be embodied in something. So that something could be a process or a method it could be a machine, it could be a manufactured article, it could be a new composition, that's what pharmaceuticals are, is new compositions of molecules. Uh, it could be an asexually produced new variety of plant, uh, but it can't be a mathematical formula, it can't be a naturally occurring substance, it can't be a law of nature, and it can't be a process done entirely with the human body, okay? Now, um, on that last one, I was talking to my teenage daughter uh, who was just uh, coming off of her homecoming dance and, uh, and was telling me all about it. And, and, I, and she's, she's going to be leading the West Lafayette dance marathon team uh, in, the, in the weeks to come. And I said, what you really need uh, to be successful in your dance marathon is for me to show up and deliver some of my patented dance moves. And she said, Dad, you can't patent dance moves, which is really the only thing standing between me and dancing with a bunch of high school kids. Um, so you can't patent dance moves, much to my chagrin, because there's a lot of money for me to be made in that. Um, you have this sort of restricted set of things you can do. And then, even if it fits those categories, you have these kind of three sorts of things that you gotta worry about. The idea or the, the, the uh, idea embodied in a thing has got to be novel, it's got to be useful, and it's got to be not obvious. Novel, useful, and not obvious. Now here's the fundamental problem, okay? The fundamental problem is if you think about novel, useful, and not obvious, that is open to tremendous amount of interpretation. Right? I'm not even sure, if you think about this in an international context, I'm not even sure that there is a corresponding set of words that means exactly the same thing uh, as novel, useful, and not obvious in every country. Okay? And so you, you sort of build into this question, how are we going to coordinate around IP laws when we can't even sort of think about it at, at its most fundamental, how are we going to agree on what we could possibly patent? A lot of the focus, a lot of the argument about the TPP comes down to the question of whether the US's system of patent laws should be extended to other countries as well. Whether we've got it down so properly and so right that everybody else should effectively adopt our system. All right? There's a lot of disagreement about that in this country, let alone in other countries. The next question, even if I get through those two things, how long should patents last? All right? At, at their heart, the idea of a patent is to spur innovation. And so there's this trade-off between how long do you need a government grant of monopoly um, to, to in, 
to spur innovation versus if you hold on to the thing too long, it doesn't help to spread the innovation, so spread the ideas. And so there's, in, in our, in our uh, length of patent rules, it's really kind of this trade-off between how long does it need to pay off versus how quickly can we get uh, an increased spread of the technology uh, by letting anybody use it. And we have very rough rules of thumb here, which are um, not adapted in specific circumstances. So um, it makes it very hard to think about a kind of customized approach where you're optimizing that sort of trade-off. Um, you get into deeper issues. So when I think about international coordination, should a patent granted in the US be automatically recognized in another country and vice versa? Right? So a lot of the rules about international coordination are under what circumstances do you have to agree to automatically recognize patents granted abroad? And you can see the reason for it, right? The, the why of it makes a lot of sense. If it takes you $2.6 billion to come up with a new molecule, the scale you need to be operating at is not, it's not national scale, it's global scale, right? You need global scale to make this happen. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't do me a lot of good if I have a grant of monopoly in my own country but nowhere else. But then you get into this real problem, which is what if country B in this example, uh, or sorry, what if country A in this example has a patent office staffed by idiots, right? Should you be obligated to accept a claim of intellectual property under a patent that makes no sense to you as a country? So go back. Useful, not obvious, and... Um, what was the other one? Novel. Novel, thank you. Novel, useful, not obvious. That's, a, that's open to a lot of interpretation. So let's take the US for example. Big conflicts between the US and Europe over whether business processes should be patentable, okay? So there was a, an important WTO case on, of all things, Burger King's method of upselling, all right? So this was a very popular thing about 15 years ago where you'd go into Burger King and you'd order like a burger and fries and a soda and it would cost $4.38 and they'd say, hey, uh, what if I round that up to $5 and I'll throw on a cookie or something like that, right? So basically get people's un, you know, disinterest in caring change around with them uh, and just round up the, the price and, and sell you a cookie. Um, burger King wanted to patent that. Okay, uh, as a way to capture increased profitability and productivity. Uh, and so there was this big fight over whether a purely business process like that, uh, a method of selling, is appropriately patentable. You get into deeper issues, which is, what if you, you kind of agree that the patent you know, makes sense, it qualifies under the usual standards, uh, it should be recognized, but what if you're in direct competition with a foreign firm and the intellectual property in question was paid for, was paid for by the foreign government, okay? Now, you say to yourself, well, you know, what, what does it matter? What does it matter to consumers who paid for it, whether it was the foreign firm or the foreign government? Well, there are different conceptions in the world of what the appropriate role of competition policy is. In the U.S. context, we really focus on gains or harms to consumers. In much of the rest of the world, including Europe, the focus of competition policy includes consumers, but it also includes disadvantageous effects that it has on competing firms, okay? That is to say, when I, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, I, I want to I think not just about whether consumers are gained or harmed, but whether my own firms are hurt by this innovation. And when you think about it through that lens, the desirability of allowing a foreign go government to directly subsidize research, generate patentable ideas, and compete with them on international markets becomes much more suspect. Then you start getting into real gray areas, all right? So let's think about Purdue University. We are a state institution that is, that is engaged in the heavy subsidy of the creation of intellectual property, okay? That's what we do as a university. And it's not just basic research, it's applied research that has direct applicability in the marketplace. That's kind of the whole point of the foundry, uh, is to take bench science into the marketplace as, as effectively as possible. Does that convey a state-generated benefit to US firms that uh, competing firms might want to worry about? 
Okay, so I don't have answers to any of those questions uh, because I think they're really hard questions. They're meant instead to just sort of illustrate why it's so difficult to come to agreement on these kinds of things, okay? Absolutely essential to getting, uh, to moving forward on, on a lot of international trade policy, but it's very, very hard. Okay, so, oh, wait, one more I wanted to say. What if it, at the end of the day, what if I, the IP in question is life-saving, okay? So uh, we, we might have really good ideas about we want to protect intellectual property in pharmaceuticals. We want to generate new inventions. Uh, new innovations come forward that treat uh, anthrax or that treat uh, HIV. Uh, and that's all well and good up to the point where you've got an epidemic on your hands. Okay? And so a lot of countries, when faced with an epidemic situation, will take drugs off patent to deal with emergencies. Okay? Many Latin American and African countries, when uh, they came to realize how effective uh, modern uh, antiretrovirals were in stopping the epidemic uh, of AIDS and HIV, uh, basically said, look, I don't care about your intellectual property. Keeping my, keeping my country alive is more important. Uh, and the U.S. Is, is no better in this. Uh, if you remember 2001, uh, right after the 9-11 attacks, there was an anthra a series of anthrax attacks that took place, letters with anthrax mailed out uh, to uh, people in Congress and some other kind of key folks. Uh, a few people died, I believe. Um, one antibiotic is particularly effective against anthrax. It's called Cipro. Uh, the U.S. took Cipro off patent in about 36 hours. Okay? because it was a, regarded as a life-saving um, uh, innovation, okay? So a lot of our, our kind of principles of protecting intellectual property are not really honored in the breach uh, on some of these things. Okay, um, I think just, just very briefly, some of the things uh, that people are very concerned about in the TPP come down to what you can regard as proactive measures to, pre to prevent theft, all right? Um, it's, you know, litigating an, an IP case is extremely hard, takes years and years and years, but what if you could embed into agreements uh, technological restrictions that make it very, very hard to engage in theft to begin with, all right? Uh, and some of the things that uh, folks regard as particularly odious about TPP kind of start heading down this path. Okay, um, I'm gonna change up a little bit from IP, from IP to talk a little bit about standards. Because I think standards are a pretty interesting case where we can think about some, um, some issues that, that are pretty rich. Okay, so in a lot of high-tech markets, standards are used to organize the market, okay? To help firms uh, um, uh, harmonize around um, a set of uh, interoperability standards that enable them to, uh, to gain, network, uh, gain network economy gains. Or they can be used to signal to consumers exactly what's going on uh, in the market, what it is that they're actually consuming, okay? Now, what's sort of interesting is if, if you think about how these are broken down, standards really come down in two buckets. So, and, and I organize them this way because international law is very different in these two cases. So product standards are characteristics of the products themselves, intrinsic characteristics. It might have to do with product quality or safety, voltage for electronics, these kinds of things, okay? By and large, countries are completely free to set whatever product standards they want, all right? So if you wanna sell a good into my market, you've gotta meet my product standards. Those are distinct from production standards, which have to do with the way a good or service is produced, okay? An example of this would be labor and environmental standards, okay? So um, the argument goes, uh, I cannot tell you how you will produce a good in order to sell it in my market. I can tell you about the attributes of the good itself, I can't tell you about how the good should be produced. Now, the problem and, and the, where this gets really, really interesting is the dividing line is not particularly clear in these cases, okay? In a number of cases, all right? So part of that goes to the following question. Is it reasonable for a consumer to regard the way something was made as an intrinsic attribute of that good or service? 
say that again. Is it reasonable for a consumer to view the way something is produced as an intrinsic attribute of that good or service? That is to say, are production standards and product standards not any way different at all? So here's an illustration. Right? I want you to look at the person next to you. Okay, look at their shirt. Okay? Now, the shirt has obvious intrinsic qualities. You can see what fabric it's made of, what texture, colors, patterns, these kinds of things. Um, those are obvious product qualities. Or, the question is this. What if you knew that that shirt was made by a 10-year-old who had been kidnapped from his parents and forced into slavery to sew shirts by a warlord somewhere? If you knew that, would it change the way you regarded the shirt and the person who's wearing it, okay? If the answer is yes, that it fundamentally changes the way you view that shirt, then you're talking about product standards. And increasingly, consumers are not only aware of, but highly invested in the question of how the things uh, that we purchase are made, that they regard it as fundamental to their consumption experience, all right? There are a couple of really interesting examples that, that I want to kind of talk to you about. So let's talk about the case of bovine growth hormone. Um, if we roll back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, Europe has on its hands an epidemic of, I'm going to blow the pronunciation here, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. I think I got that right. All right, mad cow disease. Right. So mad cow disease was racing its way through cattle populations, particularly in Great Britain. Uh, and at some point, it crossed over the species barrier. Uh, and people who had eaten cows uh, uh, infected with BSE were themselves getting a human form of, of, of mad cow. Um, by all accounts, a really, really horrible and uncurable disease, uh, not something you really want. About that same time, you start to see a movement in Europe toward much greater safety precautions around the production of, uh, of the food that we eat, okay? Um, Europe banned sales of beef, no matter where it was produced, um, if that cattle was produced using bovine growth hormone. They abided by something that in international law is called a national treatment standard. The national treatment standard basically says you're pretty free to do what you want on standards as long as foreign persons and firms are treated the same way domestic persons and firms are. And so Europe said, look, this meets the national treatment standard. Uh, you can't inject cows with bovine growth hormone if, they are grown, if, they're, if they're raised in Europe. You can't do it if they're raised in the US. You can't do that and, and have it be sold here. Okay. U.S. producers and the U.S. government on their behalf disagreed fundamentally about the safety of using bovine growth hormone and took a case to the WTO on the basic following idea, okay? What if, even if the rules are de jure non-discriminatory, meaning in law there was no discrimination between Europe and the U.S., what if it in, in fact or de facto they were discriminatory? Okay? In other words, suppose I was trying to be very strategic about creating an advantage for my national firms. What I might want to do is create a standard that in effect only applied to foreign producers because they're the only ones who use that production standard uh, in, creating, in creating goods or services, or in this case, raising meat. Okay? So now you have this real fundamental quandary that the WTO faces, which is, is the use of bovine growth hormone a product standard, right? That is, injecting cows with hormones changes the meat in a fundamental way that consumers should be aware of and afraid of, or is it a production standard, which is it's just a more effective way to get cows to grow fast and get a lot of lean mass meat to market as quickly as you can, okay? At this point, and this is really at the heart of why trying to regulate tech policies gets really very hard for these international institutions. These agreements, you'll hear all the time, these agreements are way too long. They're thousands of pages long, okay? Thousands of pages long, which is absolutely true, but they are nowhere nearly detailed enough to anticipate conflicts like this one, okay? And so you find a relatively small appellate panel trying to make a decision about whether this is a legitimate thing to restrict. And so uh, they came up with, more or less on the spot, a scientific validity test. 
okay, that said, if there's good scientific evidence that this stuff is really harmful to hu for human consumption, then it's reasonable to, to exclude it from the market. But if you can't show proof, uh, then, then you can't, then it's just a production standard. It doesn't really affect the meat. Um, the Europeans just fundamentally disagree that this idea that with sort of like how you set the null hypothesis. Is something safe until it's proven to be dangerous, which is more or less the US position in a lot of cases, or is it dangerous until it's proven to be safe, right? And so that kind of disagreement about where you draw the line on new technologies and new food products um, really is at the heart of a lot of this particular um, case. The WTO ruled uh, in favor of the US and saying, uh, that we're going to go ahead and take the bulk of the evidence to say bovine growth hormones are not, not, not uh, harmful to consumers. The, the challenge that I think you really run into this is increasingly, I started off by saying, how do you facilitate trade in corn? It's 1880, right? The problem is nothing is corn in 1880 anymore. Corn isn't corn in 1880 anymore, right? Because we're concerned about traceability. We're concerned about whether or not the seeds that go into the plants, that go into the food chain, that go into our food processors that wind up in our products, whether those things were genetically modified, whether they were produced using a heavy use of pesticides, uh, and on and on. Okay? And so standards, especially in food products, high technology food products, are really to the point now where um, the, the, the linkage of global supply chains requires, um, if you're going to be concerned with what you're, what you're consuming at the far end, you need to impose traceability standards all the way up to the front end. Okay? That is to say, you've got to have a really good understanding what the genetic material in the seed was, not just where it was planted, but were there any genetically modified or pesticide using crops next to it, um, did they mingle anywhere in the transport channel? Uh, did they mingle anywhere in the bakeries? Did they make their way into, into products? All right? And that becomes a real challenge because um, if, if, if we sort of can't fundamentally agree on what the appropriate standard is, it becomes very, very hard uh, to think about how this should look. Okay? So even corn isn't corn anymore. Uh, from an international standards standpoint, uh, and there's broad disagreement about this, uh, about both the merits of imposing standards and how you'd actually go about doing it. Okay, so at this point, I hope you're getting the sense in which this is a really seriously Sisyphean task to try and get some kind of coordination on this. Let me just give you one more example really quickly, and then, uh, and then I want to kind of pull all this together, all right? So let's talk about antitrust or competition policy. So the heart of the idea, in, in the US we call it antitrust policy, in Europe it's called competition policy. It's the idea that markets, sort of free markets are not free if a dominant firm can use its market position to um, raise prices, restrict quantities, stifle innovation, okay? And the whole heart, the whole idea behind antitrust or competition policy is to prevent the emergence of dominant market positions that would enable a single firm or a collection of firms from, from dominating a market in a way that's either harmful to consumers, US, that's the US worry, or harmful to competing firms, that's the European worry. Okay, so I wanted, to, I wanted an example of this to try and, and illustrate the point, uh, and so I've opened up uh, Reuters, and here's a story from Saturday uh, that illustrates this, okay? So the, Europe is currently investigating Google to stop anti-competitive Android practices. Okay, what practices are they talking about? Um, when Google negotiates with um, handset manufacturers and with national telecom carriers, they offer incentives to, uh, to those carriers to ensure that a suite of Google products is installed on the phones, okay? And if they do that, um, if, they, if they bundle the software together, those folks get steep discounts, right? In the language of competition policy, that kind of bundling, that kind of linkage between uh, the handset 
and the operating system and the apps is called vertical restraints. Right? You use your position in one link in the chain to reinforce your position up or downstream from that link. Okay? Now, the, the problem here is Google, I'm sure, would make a consumer-based argument for why consumers are better off if they are free to innovate, to create suites of software that customers want, and to provide them at a discounted price for firms who go along with them. Okay? That all sounds good. The problem is that uh, if you kind of spin this forward, uh, it's not necessarily obvious that those consumers are better off in the long run uh, if Google takes an increasingly dominant market share. And it's certainly not good for competing firms uh, who might be closed out of access to those, to those markets. Okay? So at the, what, what you wind up in these kinds of cases is the desire to innovate and the desire to uh, create uh, a kind of harmonious or synchronized experience between uh, the, the, you know, the handset and the operating system and the, and, the, and the applications runs afoul of how governments might want to regulate these policies or regulate this market. Okay, so I'm going to forget about tax. So I, I was going to go on to taxes, but I think I'm going to run out of time if I do that. So let me just say um, uh, there was this, this sort of really interesting case in the last month where, uh, where Ireland was giving uh, extremely large tax breaks to Apple to convince them to produce a, to uh, locate a manufacturing plant uh, in Ireland. And the European Union said that was a, uh, a misuse of, of tax law within Europe and that Apple had to pay Ireland $14.5 billion. And Ireland says, no, you don't. I don't want your money. Don't give you your money. We'd rather have your plant uh, than, than, than your tax payments, right? Uh, so this thing's playing out even now, uh, although some people in Ireland are waking up to the fact that they might like $15 billion because the plant's already sitting there. So uh, it's a little, a little hard to go back on that one. Uh, so that's playing out right now. Okay, so let me kind of pull a few things together here. So corn versus computer chips, corn versus airplanes. Um, a modern trade policy, and you saw the 30 chapters of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, reflects a broader view of those trade, of, of trade impediments that we used to have. It's not just about tariffs anymore. It's about a demand for, or you can put need in parentheses, you know, in quotation marks, the need for a more highly complex and a harmonized set of regulations that doesn't end at the border, right? That doesn't end at the border. You, it's, it's more or less impossible in the things that we've been talking about here to only regulate what comes in and out of the country. You have to change fundamentally everything about the way you handle intellectual property and investment rules uh, uh, and taxation and product standards and so on, okay? Now, making this even harder is, and, and, and I think I'm on pretty safe ground here, we understand extremely well the benefits to consumers and the distributional consequences of free trade in corn circa 1880, okay? We understand that extremely well. We don't have a good idea about the right policies. And I, and I mean something like both rooted in theory, rooted in careful evidence. We have very little guidance from the economics profession about any of the stuff I've been talking about, okay? There is wide disagreement about the right set of policies from a sense of what would help consumers, what would ha help national welfare, we just, we're really, I mean, I think in fairness, and a lot of this stuff kind of, kind of at sea, which means that as you are pushing forward to these deeper and deeper and deeper agreements, we are more and more untethered from what I would consider an academically rigorous defense of why those policies should look the way they should, okay? Now, let me come back to the title of the talk, Indispensable Sisyphean. Why? Given everything I've just said about how hard this is, why is getting agreement on this stuff so important, if you could do it? I think it really comes down to three things. The incre increasingly, our economy is an economy where values and ideas, not stuff. Scale is critical, and everything's interlinked. We hit those just quickly. All right, 
What, two graphs here. This comes from Gapminder. If you haven't ever used the Gapminder website, go, go do it because it, it opens up a lot of interesting stuff. On the left-hand side is a graph of income per capita in a country against agriculture as a share of GDP. Right? Very clear relationship. The poorer you are, the more of your national output is agriculture. And then you go on down. The big blue circle, that's India. Big red circle's China. Big yellow circle's the United States. Okay? So at the very high end, 70% of national output is agriculture. Down when you get to the US, it's about 5% of national output. All right? So what happens as economies grow rich? Well, that's the second graph over here. Again, same thing, per capita income on the horizontal. Industry, manufacturing that is, as a share of GDP here. And it's got this interesting inverse U shape. Okay? That is, as you get richer, more and more of what you do shifts into manufacturing. And then you hit a peak, and then it comes back down again. All right? So China is at a peak right now. Right? It's at the top of the inverse U. About 50% of, of Chinese national output is in manufacturing. It's dropped in the US down to 20, 25%. This is circa 2005, I think. So those numbers, the exact numbers have changed a little bit, but the basic story hasn't. What's that leave? That basically leaves services and the value of idea generation. Okay? So when we think about a country like the US, it's not producing a lot of agriculture anymore. It's not producing a lot of industrial output anymore. What it's really producing is a lot of ideas embodied in intellectual property. Okay? Countries like the United States and all of these countries over here do not have an option to neglect this issue. It's so central to what we produce and what we do now that if we don't get some understanding and some coordination on these kinds of issues, increasingly the fundamental thing that we're best at um, is not going to be valuable, or be, not going to be valued in the world economy because it's not protected. The second piece is scale. I've alluded to this a couple of times. New drug development costs 2.6 billion. Tesla's new Gigafactory, uh, where they're going to produce. Um, uh, modern um, batteries for their, for their electric car, $5 billion. The Airbus 380, $25 billion. You got to have global scale to recover those investments. You don't have the option to try and make your investment money back just by selling to your domestic market. And the third thing is everything's tied together. Okay? So where is the Airbus A380 produced? All right. Um, this is just showing you different, facil different facilities within Europe and all the ways in which goods, the parts are moving around uh, as they are constructing the A380. So you've got eight different countries involved one way or the other. I think it's a real question what's going to happen with Great Britain going forward. Um, but that actually is a pretty simple production process compared to the iPhone. Okay. So the iPhone, this is just sort of the, the high-level uh, assembly locations, uh, China, Japan, the US, and so on, right? But, um, and you've got everything from rare minerals there to the display to, to the battery and so on. That actually understates how complex this is. So I went and found a disaggregation for each one of these subcomponents and then some more where all that stuff's located in the world. Um, so in this next slide, uh, the dark thing on the left is the different subcomponents. The red is all the different countries involved. Okay? All of this stuff, all of it, is bound up in some combination of intellectual property law, competition law, standards promotion and, and, and uh, promulgation. Um, and you don't have the option. I mean, for goodness, just the glass, the glass screen involves value added from Corning in, it took me you know, three lines to list all the countries there. Okay? So these things are just inextricably linked. Now, back to Sisyphus. Um, it is not, so the, the point of Sisyphus is not just that it's hard, but it's potentially and ultimately futile. Right? That no matter how hard you work at rolling the boulder up the hill, it's going to come crashing back down on you. Okay? So everything I hope that you've gotten so far is that it's really, really hard to get this stuff right. It's really important. It's really hard. 
Is it fundamentally futile? Well, I present Brexit, okay? At its heart, I mean, Brexit's about a lot of stuff, right? But if you want to look at the, the stated economic case for why Brexit is a good thing, right? It's that being enmeshed in an increasingly complex regulatory web with the rest of Europe had undermined British sovereignty to such an extent that the Brits could no longer abide it, okay? Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on there. So you know, don't, wanna, don't wanna kinda oversell the case that this was just it, but um, you talk, you, know, you, 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 you talk to the folks who argue the economic case and they say, look, the effort to try and, and, and to get all of these, harm, these policies that I've been talking about harmonized within Europe were ultimately so offensive to the British population that they said, I'd rather just get out of this entirely. And there's an irony in this, in this headline, and I'm gonna stop with this. Um, the Brexit minister says they want the freest possible trade with the EU. They fundamentally differ with the EU about what free trade means, okay? The Brits who, are, who promoted Brexit think free trade means you stay out of our business and goods move freely across borders. The Europeans who uh, are on the other side of this say, you can't have free movement of goods without coordinating on labor and environmental standards, investment standards, um, the way in which uh, intellectual property is created, and on down the long list of things I've been talking about, that free trade is inextricable from harmonization on those issues, okay? And so you have, I think, this problem, which is, um, the harder you work to move the, 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 the boulder up the hill, the more offensive in some sense you are to the native populations or the, the domestic populations who are affected uh, by the increased regulatory uh, burdens of trying to harmonize these things. So, um, I wish I could leave you on a good note there, uh, but, um, but I'm a little afraid that the more we need this stuff, the more we need to coordinate on tech policies, the more we're gonna get this. Thank you. <laughs>